Thanks for watching my Christmas cookie tutorial. For more easy cookie decorating, please subscribe to my channel. Oh, man, babe, these look so good. I wasn't sure that I could pull it off, but go ahead, try one. Oh, no, that's okay. No, I, I want you to have the first bite. Come on. Uh, <laughs> Merry Christmas, babe. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I nailed it. <laughs> this is all good. No, don't do it. Oh. Mm. Babe. Are they all like that? Uh, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be okay. Oh. We no, can scrape no, off no, the icing. No, no, no. Oh, I oh, no. Slice and bake. I got some slice and bake. I love it. Oh. They're just cookies. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Meeting Place. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Gary. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad that you decided to spend some of your Sunday morning with us. Uh, let the host know where you're tuning in from, whether it's from the island or somewhere else in BC or Canada or even south of the border, wherever. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Just want to give you a quick update on our Compassion Project. And if you're tuning in for the first time or you've been away and you're thinking, Compassion Project, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Back in November, we were presented with an opportunity to partner with Compassion Canada to come alongside them and support, financially support, a church in San Juan Tuya in Chiapas, Mexico, down by the Guatemalan border. And uh, COVID-19, bottom line, is it has devastated some economies that were already on the brink uh, with poverty and all. And it has kind of made it really hard for the local churches in these communities to reach out and help their, the communities they find them in. And so we had this opportunity to join in with Compassion and raise some funds and so after meeting with lead team and staff and praying about it, we set, we set a goal for us, a pretty robust goal, but we're confident we can do this, uh, to make, uh, hit a goal of $20,000 by May, May 2021. And I want to say, we started this November, the last Sunday in November, and we are already 30% of the way there. We're at $6,000. Thank you for your generosity. It is fantastic that what you guys have done. Now, our over, the overall goal of this, this is not just a one and done financial thing where we're going to kind of help these, this community out with some money and then that's it. We are fostering, building and nurturing a relationship with them that's going to be ongoing. Our goal is to, when, when it's safe to do so, sponsor some children from this community and then when it's safe to travel, send teams of people from the meeting place down to this community to just love on them. And if you have happened to sponsor a child from this community, you'll be able to meet your sponsored child, which is a life-changing experience. I've done it myself, and it's a life-changing experience for both you and your sponsored child. So things we're looking forward to, but thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, the other thing is the call team is up and running. It's all going, and maybe some of you have received some calls this week. If not, there's two reasons you haven't. One, they haven't got to your name yet. Or two, they don't have your number. When we kicked this whole thing off, we realized we had a bunch of emails, but not a whole lot of phone numbers. So if you would like to receive a call and talk to a human other than the one that's in your bubble, uh, which would be kind of cool, uh, send us your 
phone number at the address that's on the screen and we will put you on the call list. And this, you know, bottom line is we just miss you guys. We just want to check in, see how you're doing, see if there's some way we can pray for you. That's all this is about. So if you would like to be placed on that call list, email us your number and we will make sure someone from our team gets a hold of you. So, T minus four days to the longest day of the year. Now, some of you might be saying, hang on a second, the longest day of the year, that's in June, isn't it? Well, actually, yes, you're right. June 21st, 2021 is the actual longest day of the year, technically. But if you're a kid or a kid at heart, December 24th is the longest day of the year. Time seems to just slow right down, each second ticking by with with the cruel tenacity to just make Christmas morning come that much slower. And so to help Christmas come a little quicker so you can find out what Santa brought you, we are having our annual Christmas Eve service. Five o'clock on Thursday. It's family friendly. It's going to be a great time. We got some awesome music lined up, an encouraging message. We're even trying a couple of things that we haven't done before at a Christmas Eve service. Some of those things involve you with that video that we want you to make, uh, as well as some other surprises. And, but you're going to have to tune in to check out what they're like. And so make sure you do that. And that is going to be happening 5 o'clock on Thursday. So did you see what I did there? That was a totally sh- shameless plug. And I'll admit it. But I, I also did something else there that you may or may not have been aware of. I set you up. I set you up for a possible disappointment. Uh, And I did it by creating an expectation. You know, I kind of bragged about what was going to happen and talked it up and, hey, this is going to be awesome, which it is, by the way. Uh, And now what you've started to do is naturally you've started to formulate an expectation in your mind of how things are going to roll out on Christmas Eve for the service. And here's the thing. If it meets or exceeds your expectations, you're going to be like, two thumbs up. That was awesome. So glad we tuned in for that. On the other hand, if your expectations are up here and we come in around down here, well, you're going to be disappointed because isn't that where disappointment lives? in an unfulfilled or unmet expectation. If you don't believe me, I mean, look at 2020. Who of us here thinks, is disappointed with 2020 and how it all rolled out, right? Because we all had expectations going into 2020. My wife and I, we we expected to be on our motorbikes in July heading to the Grand Canyon. I've never seen the Grand Canyon before, so we had this trip all planned, didn't happen. Uh, maybe for you, it was, it was around, um, you wanted to spread your wings. You graduated from high school or university, and it's like, okay, I'm just going to be me, and I'm going to backpack through Europe and hopscotch around the Mediterranean Rim, whatever it happens to be. Or maybe you applied to go to school in another country. You know, there's all these things that we expected to happen. I know there was a lot of you that you had plans, you you had expectations around what your wedding, your graduation would look like. And all that changed. It didn't go as you expected it to go. Uh, Peter, our our youth pastor, uh, he was heading to Mexico with a bunch of the city youth to build homes in Mexico. They had done a ton of work and training. It was started way back in 2019. They did fundraising, got the team all ready to go. They were like a week away from leaving when COVID-19 hit, and the borders started to close. And so the trip was put on hold for who knows how long. Understandably, they were disappointed. And then, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Christmas, this Christmas, with the current health orders that are in place, I mean, who isn't disappointed at how Christmas is going to look this year, right? Things aren't going the way they're supposed to, not the way we expected. And sometimes when that stuff like that happens, it makes you wonder where God is in all of it, right? After all, he's in control of everything, so, like, what the heck is going on? I mean, who of us here that are tuning in this morning 
haven't at some point over the ten, past 10 months kind of looked up at the sky and said, okay, God, what's going on? You know, or your higher power. Like, what's going on? Why this pandemic? What's the point? I've done it. I'll be honest. Heck, I'll, <laughs> I'll be brutally honest. I even took a step further. I kind of looked up and said, okay, God, you know what? If I was in charge, things would be completely different. You know, may maybe that sentiment rings true for you. Maybe not. But I know I'm not alone because I'm pretty sure Joseph and Mary, you know, Jesus' parents, kind of had those thoughts running through their head as life unfolded for them. I mean, yeah, the Christmas story doesn't, you know, as presented in the Bible, doesn't get into all the, the stuff that was going on in their heads, the questions they might have been asking or wondering, right? But I don't think it's much of a stretch to think that they were wondering what the heck God was up to. I mean, let's just put ourselves in Mary and Joseph's shoes for a second. Okay, life was probably just rolling along, nothing out of the ordinary. You know, Joseph was building homes and barns and kitchen tables. Mary was doing her chores and, and all that type of stuff. And then one day they bump into each other and it's love at first sight. And they're just all googly-eyed over each other. And we can imagine that they took long, moonlit walks at night, talking about their future and how it would all be, how they would work hard, and then they would get married, buy a house, have kids, get a golden retriever, an SUV, right? Life would all be good. And then they got engaged, the venue was secured. The invitation sent, the caterer booked, and then the unexpected happened. An angel shows up and says, Mary, I've got some news for you. You're pregnant. You're going to give birth to God's son. I mean, the last thing Mary was expecting was to be expecting, right? Right? This wasn't how life was supposed to go. Like, what is going on? Now she's left with this unenviable task to go and tell her fiancé that she's pregnant and it's not his, and it's not any other man's either, that God placed it there. <laughs> we can imagine how Joseph took the news. Well, we know how he took the news. It wasn't what he was expecting. So he was disappointed. He wanted to call the whole thing off. But then an angel shows up for him and backs up everything Mary just said. And so he goes through with it. And they get, he says, okay, fine, I, I, I won't divorce or I'll, we'll get married. Now, no doubt people are still whispering, you know, in this town that they find themselves in, this town of Nazareth. There's probably these people, hey, did you hear about Mary and Joseph? Right? All that talk going on. But I would imagine that they had some, to some degree kind of got into a rhythm of normalcy. You know, they got used to the fact that, okay, she's pregnant, the angel came, okay, we're kind of wrapped our heads around that, we're kind of just moving forward with this whole thing. Uh, Mary, no doubt, you know, had the nursery, Jesus' room all set up, you know, all painted, and she's got the crib with the, the dinosaur mobile, and she's got the change table all set up, and the rocking chair for those late night feedings, and all the sleepers are laid out, and the diapers, and the wipes, and the whole bit. The burp cloths. I mean, she's getting excited. She's closing in on the big day. She's closing in on nine months. This could happen any time. And then the unexpected happens. Joseph shows up one day and he says, Mary, I know like, you're really pregnant, like really, really pregnant. Uh, and I got some bad news and I got some really bad news, okay? Caesar has called for a census, which means I have to go to my hometown in Bethlehem to register, okay? So that's the bad news. Here's the really bad news. You have to come with me. 
And the only way to get you there, the best way to get you there in the condition you're in, is on the back of a donkey. And I know it's not the, the news you've been expecting. I know you weren't expecting that. But it, we'll take it slow, okay? I'll, I'll slow things down. We'll take our time. When we get there, I'll, I'll book a room. You can have a nice hot bath and relax. I'll order in room service. It'll be great. Then I'll just simply register and load you back up and we'll get home and you can have the baby. It'll be great. And so off they go on this long, arduous journey to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem, which is about 125 kilometers away from where they are in Nazareth. Now, a lot of historians kind of guess that it took them probably between four and eight days to get there. And it would have been a trip that took them over hills and small mountains and down through valleys, and it would have been dusty. It would have been cold at night. They would have been on, spent at least three or four nights on the road, sleeping at the side of the road, in who knows what conditions. But they finally arrive in Bethlehem. Now it's just a matter of Joseph, you know, going and getting a room and then going and registering and then loading Mary back up and heading back home so she can have her baby in the safety of, and comfort of her own home. That's how they expected it to go. But, listen to this. While they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Not exactly the way Joseph and Mary expected Jesus' entrance into the world to go down. And understandably so. After all, Mary is giving birth to the long-awaited Messiah the king, the ruler that would set the people of Israel free from Roman oppression. But here they are. They're, they're in this dank, stinky stable surrounded by barn animals, sheep and donkeys and goats and who knows what else, cobwebs. There's mice running around. And it's just all hanging in the stench of animal urine and dung. Not at all what they had in mind. Uh, I came across uh, a book uh, written by, uh, he's a great author, pastor, his name's Max Licato, uh, and it's a book called The Cast of Characters, and in there he does a little uh, biography on Joseph, and in this he talks about a possible conversation that Joseph may have had with God as Mary's labor pains kind of kicked into high gear. And here, here's what he writes. Listen to this. This is Joseph. This isn't the way I planned it, God. You ever said that? <laughs> this is what I was expecting, God. Not at all. My child being born in a stable? This isn't the way I thought it would be. A cave with sheep and donkeys and hay and straw? My wife giving birth with only the stars to hear her pain? This isn't at all what I imagined. No, I imagined family. I imagined grandmothers. I imagined neighbors clustered outside the door and friends standing at my side. I imagined the house erupting with the first cry of the infant. Slaps on the back, loud laughter, jubilation. That's how I thought it would be. And I'm sure Mary would have shared similar thoughts. You know, I can imagine her as she's laying on the floor of a stinky stall. You know, like, God, this isn't how I pictured this happening. I had everything set up. Everything's ready to go. I've got the crib. I've got the dinosaur mobile. Everything, it's ready to go. I got a nice terry cloth sleeper to wrap baby Jesus in. The last thing I was expecting was this. This isn't what's, how it was supposed to happen disappointment. Maybe you can relate to that on some level. 
You know, maybe for you, your story is around maybe a promotion at work. You know, you've worked hard, you've hit all your sales targets, all that type of stuff. And there's a promotion you've applied for and everyone in the office is like, oh man, you're a shoe in Like, you got this, dude. Like, there isn't even a second. You're it. Or maybe for you, you've applied for a course uh, in a school that's really hard to get into, super competitive, but your marks are right there. And everyone that you've talked to said, oh man, with your marks, you're guaranteed, you're in. Pack your bags, get ready to go. You're going to school. Or, or maybe you put an offer in on your first house or a, your dream home. And it's a solid offer. And it's, it's like a done deal. And so your expectations are high. But then the call comes, right? And you didn't get the promotion. You went to someone else. You're told to maybe apply next year. You might get in then. Or at the last minute, the deal for the house fell through. Unmet expectations result in disappointment. We experience it all the time. And often the higher our expectations, the greater the disappointment. And so the question that comes to mind uh, for me when, when things don't go the way I think they should, the way I'm expecting them to go, is simple. Why? I'm sure, I'm not alone, and I'm sure Mary and Joseph were asking the same question. Why? Why, God? Why this way? Why in a barn? Why would you choose a, a, a glorified manger stuffed with hay to be the first place that you lay your head? They're, they're great questions, and when you think them through, you think, yeah, like, why? Why would you come that way? I mean, why would God, the creator of everything that we see, hear, smell, touch, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the oceans, the mountains, the fish, the birds, the animals, you, me, why would the God that created all of that enter into his creation the way he did? It's not how I would have done it. I know how I would have done it. I would have marched in like Mel Gibson did in Braveheart on the back of a horse with a sword going, Freedom! Right? But God comes in the most unexpected way. And so as I was, as I was putting this, this talk together, I was thinking, okay, like why? I was trying to answer the question, why? And t two answers kind of bubbled to the surface for me, and I'm just going to throw them out for you to kind of think about, roll around. But the first is, I think God chose to be born in a dark, dirty, dingy barn because he wanted to identify with our struggles, your struggles and my struggles. He wanted to show us that what he's like, that he's not some far off, uncaring God that has no idea what we're up against. Not sure if you're familiar with a man named Father Damien. A lot of, a lot of people I've talked to, some, had, some hadn't, but he, he's been described as the martyr of charity because of his willingness to live and serve a leper colony that was located on the island of Molokai in Hawaii during the 1800s. For more than 16 years, he served those who lived in this government quarantined settlement. And during his time there, he, he built houses so they could have shelter. He built schools so they could learn. He built roads so they could get around. He built church, a church so they could hear about the God who created them and loved them, even though the rest of society had written them off. He built coffins, some, some say upwards of 2,000 coffins, and dug graves so that those who died of this horrible disease could die with dignity. Because of his work, this village became a place where you could live. It wasn't just a place you went to die. 
While he was there, he did nothing. Father Damien did nothing to separate himself from those he was serving. He was right there with them, up close and personal. He shared meals with them. He, I heard that he smoked the ceremonial pipes that they smoked. He tra- changed and dressed their wound, wounds. He hugged them and embraced them. These people that no one else dared touch. But one day, all of that changed. One day as he stood in the church, ready to share with those that were gathered that day about the God that loved them, opened his sermon with two words. And those two words were this. We lepers. We lepers. You see, Father Damien, through his contact with him, had contracted leprosy. And so now he wasn't just helping them. He had become one of them. And one day, God came to this planet as a baby. And in essence, the message was the same. We lepers. Because God was now one of us. You see, when Jesus was born, he wasn't born into some wealthy family with political power or persuasion. No, no, no. Jesus came in such a way that he would experience the struggles, the pain, and the heartache that we all feel as we make our way through life. Which leads to the second reason I believe God chose to come the way he did. To show his humility. To show us a different way to live. God could have stayed up in the sky or wherever you think he is and just shouted down orders on how we should live our life. You know, do this and don't do that. You know, can't you read the signs? That's an old 60s song. But he didn't. Instead, he chose to leave all of that, to step across the universe onto this spinning rock to be with you and to be with me. There's some beautiful words uh, that were written by the Apostle Paul. Paul's a guy we talk about a lot around here. Uh, He, at one point in his his career, was actually out to stamp out Christianity. Anyone that was following this resurrected, the story of this resurrected Jesus, he was trying to wipe them out. And then one day he has this miraculous encounter with the resurrected Jesus. You can read about that story in, in the book of Acts. Chapter 9, it's a great story. That whole book is actually fantastic. Uh, But he wrote some words. And in these words that he wrote to these people, these first century Christians, he, he points to Jesus as our example of how to live and describes what he's like. Listen to these words. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, the same attitude, the same perspective as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, which was the most humiliating, degrading way to die. The Christmas story, God becoming one of us, that's what the whole Christmas story is about, is both an example and an invitation for us to live life differently. Jesus humbly gave up his privileges. And the invitation to us is to do the same. 
to instead of looking out for our own interests first and seeing what we can get, to instead look to the needs of others. And that could be as simple as, you know, standing in a line at a grocery store, which some of those lines are pretty long right now with all the social distancing, and there's a mother there with squirming kids and she's trying to just pay for her groceries, giving her your spot in line so she can get through a little bit faster. It can be as simple as waving that driver that refuses to signal his way in to the, to the traffic and just giving them space, waving them in, letting them have their space. The Christmas story is an invitation for us to respond with grace to a coworker or a significant other who's upset with us and is on the verbal attack. The invitation of Christmas is to knock on a neighbor's door just to see how they're doing. The invitation of Christmas is to serve those in society, those in society that have been deemed undeserving, the lepers. The Christmas story is, is God making a statement, a statement of his extravagant, over-the-top, ridiculous, mind-blowing love for you and for me and for all of us and then to extend that love to others. Now, God loves you. He is for you. Even though your circumstances right now might be saying, well, I find that hard to believe. He has your best interest in heart. He does. I, tr- I, I truly, truly believe that. But I also know that that reality can be hard to accept especially when life doesn't go as we expect it to go. Like I said earlier, disappointment comes as the result of an unmet or unfulfilled expectation. God showed up in a way that Mary and Joseph didn't expect. And no doubt they were disappointed at the perceived loss at how things should have gone. They had their picture and it wasn't lining up. But they hung in there. They hung in there, and what they did is the only thing they can do. The only thing that we're to try and do more and more each day is trusting that God knows what he's doing. But trusting God and and, and trusting that he knows what he's doing in the moment is so hard, isn't it? It's so hard. Because in the moment, when when we're living through disappointment... You know, the disappointment of some unmet expectation, whatever that is for you, we often can't see past that moment. And that can be confusing, it can be frustrating, it can be discouraging, and it's definitely disappointing. And I know lots of us are feeling that right now with Christmas. But here's the thing that's cool. When we come to the place where we can look back like we do on the Christmas story and see God's fingerprints all over our lives. See where he guided and directed, protected and provided. And in the end, gave us something so much better than we could ever have imagined. But again, in the moment, that is really hard. And so we're just asked to take one step at a time. And in the end, Mary and Joseph, they got to be part of something so amazing, so incredible, so unexpected. And the same is true for you and me. We're going to learn as we continue to go through this larger series that, we're, that we embarked on back in the beginning of the month that's going to take us right up to Easter the way we get to trust, learn to trust God more is to get to know him better than we currently do. And that's the goal of this series over the next several months. And I'm really glad I get to be on that journey with you. I invite you to pray. God, there is so much that goes on in this Christmas story that reveals who you are and what you're like. That you're humble. 
that you're gracious, you're patient. You see things that we can't even begin to imagine. And we, we see how you, you love to work through people that are just open to that possibility. That we can just humble ourselves and say, I, I, I can't do this, I don't know what direction to go, but you do. And I'm trusting you in that. And so as we head into this Christmas season, uh, under these weird circumstances with this pandemic, I just pray that we would just keep looking to you because ultimately that's where our hope is found. And that one day, one day in the future, we'll be able to look back and see your fingerprints all over our lives. We thank you for that. And we pray this in your awesome name. Amen.